Uh, hello, thank you for joining us. Yeah. It's so great to be yeah. here with you, um, you know, elevated, so to say. <laughs> so, you know, you and I have been talking about, you've been coding since you've been 13, what, is that right? Yeah, and you know, we're all used to, I mean, I've been coding for all my life, and now, you know, you don't have to code anymore. Well, you still need to code, but let's say, imagine that soon you don't have to code anymore. You just direct the computer, you know, the programming language is English, you tell it, you know, what you want. Uh, how is that going to, what is going to, what are we going to do? Are we going to even click and use interfaces? Where do you think all of this is going? Uh-oh. <laughs> Trouble. We'll have to project. <laughs> say one to three. <laughs> say what you think I will say. <laughs> <laughs> I think you, you're going to say there will be no apps. There will be no clicks. <laughs> I'm putting words into his mouth, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're just going to be talking to computers like you and I talking right now. <laughs> but wait, it's pretty hard right now. They just don't, don't, take, don't take my word for it. You know, it looks easy, but there's so much plumbing in the back still. Is that right? Is this the, no, it's <gasps> working. Yes! My God. <laughs> Let's go. Technology. Let's go. <laughs> all right, tell um, us. First of all, thank you so much for having us. Um, I get to speak about one of my favorite topics with one of my favorite people. Um, I wish I could be interviewing you about these things because uh, you have such an amazing track record in, in, in this space. Um, but yeah, the first question I guess was, will we just be directing them? Um, and I think this is a very interesting question to, to what extent will we you know, keep giving natural language input to these systems? Um, and I think what's increasingly happening is that these systems are becoming more proactive. So anticipating our, our needs and then giving us the most useful actions before we even ask for that. And I think that's a big shift because now, especially as you're rolling out to you know, hundreds of thousands of, of employees, how do you enable every single one of them to instruct these models yes. effectively? And I think ultimately we shouldn't be instructing them, but they should be surfacing the most useful actions to us. That's right. So I think increasingly in the background and, and proactive like that. Well, so you talk about practice, right? Yeah, I, I would really like to say, hey, your boss, you know, is still waiting for that answer that you didn't give him, you know, for three days now. Or, you know, your train ticket, your train is in, in two hours, your taxi is, I've ordered the taxi for you. You know, an agent that really thinks about you, observes you, you know, pushes you to do, nudges you to do the good things for you, whether it's health-wise or, you know, work-wise or whatever, you know, are we there yet? Like, how are you applying this yourself and Santa? What, are you, what is your thinking there in terms of actually building those products? I think uh, one of the biggest problems with AI systems generally is that the people that create them have so little imagination for what they could actually do. <laughs> and it's like examples like the ones, not to put you on the spot, but like you, like you brought up. They're like, oh, it can help you plan trips and it can help you find the best spot for wine tasting uh, and so on. And very few of these AI researchers are actually close to the real world applications of these systems. I think one example that I'm very excited about is for research. You know, just the process of doing research today. First, you have to search. Um, you sit in keyword-based systems. It's effectively impossible to get an answer. Then you collect all of this data. You want to process and analyze that. Usually, this type of scientific research can be months-long uh, processes. Now, you can have an AI system search through all of these apps, synthesize that knowledge, and just give you a first draft uh, immediately. Um, so I think that's the first stage of sort of knowledge access and knowledge retrieval. Um, I think that the, the next stage is, you know, how can we make these systems more agentic? And that's something we're seeing, uh, we're seeing happening right now. And the shift is crazy. Like the productivity savings that we saw from this initial set of applications, that was sort of a 30% productivity yep. gain. That's when perfect. you can have these agentic, you know, long horizon tasks, 
being automated, that's 90% of productivity savings. So I think increasingly, you know, first just solve knowledge retrieval and, and search, but increasingly over time, also getting these long horizon tasks right. And we're already seeing examples of that working really well. So great, you know, I might have an agent, I may have a dozen agents, maybe hundreds of agents, you have yours, you know, our agents talk. How do we make sure they don't run off to Vegas and spend all of our money? <laughs> it's a very, very good, uh, very good question. Um, I think that's one of the layers that we really need to get right when we deploy this into companies. First, it's the grounding. So ultimately, you need to connect them into all of your company's apps. It needs to be able to search in all of these apps with your permissions. Um, then you need to set up all of the guardrails so it doesn't go and, and do things that are outside of the scope. And I think this is what's been holding a lot of the applications back, is that there hasn't been this layer of guardrails and permissioning and so on uh, on top of them. But I think that's what we're getting, getting right, uh, right now. And often this is also through a multi-agent approach. So you can have another agent checking so that uh, the other agent stays in check. So more concretely, when you implement it within SANA, what does that look like? Give us a tangible example of how that manifests in the app and a little bit about how difficult or easy it is to actually impl implement today. I mean, how I like to see uh, SANA is like a polymath in, in your pocket. So Leo da Vinci was, you know, known as... Oh, this thing is starting to spin. They promised <laughs> us that this was going to happen. So Leo da Vinci is known because he's, he was the last person to have all human knowledge in his head. And I think Sana is sort of the, the first, you know, assistant to have all of the company's knowledge in its head. And as you can deploy that to every employee, you can basically give the employee expert level knowledge on day one. And, and so that's the first step. You know, we make all of your company's knowledge accessible. We sort of uh, increase the level of expertise immediately for them. But I think increasingly what, what Sun is being able to do is not just serve you knowledge and help you access and, and find that, but also increasingly automate tasks on your behalf. So whether you're a sales rep, you can have Sana automatically update Salesforce according to the exact format that your company wants that, that, that in. Or if you're a, a researcher and you need to um, process 20 documents and retrieve 10 different answers across those, um, Sana is moving from just being the knowledge assistant to increasingly this agentic capabilities. So that, that's super, super valuable. But you know, your workflow is probably very different from my, my workflow. And even if we are in the same job function, so you were mentioning Salesforce, let's say we're both sales folks, you know, selling into different accounts, but I probably have a slightly different way of using Salesforce and using uh, my, maybe my email, whether it's Outlook or, or something else, you know, and there's a workflow that I'm navigating across all of those different applications. You talked to me uh, before about having hyper-personalized user interface. Uh, and I wonder how would that actually manifest? Because user interfaces have this really nagging problem. If you change them on users, the users get really upset. Yeah. You know, I tried that at Wikipedia. I got, you know, I thought, you know, the Second World War, you know, came back, you know, it's that bad. So how do you navigate that? How do you, A, customize for this individual user needs, and at the same time, keep enough consistency not to sort of get your users upset? Of course, so, I mean, you have these muscle memory apps, and a muscle memory app is an app like Spotify. You don't want it to continuously sort of change and adapt to your behaviors. You want to open it and know exactly where to find your playlists and the most recent playlist. But then as you're solving more workflows, often where you have to jump between multiple different systems, retrieve something there, push something there, I think these sorts of workflows will increasingly happen in a single app. And that app will generate the UI that's needed for the next step. Will that app be Santa? I'm, I'm hoping to be that app, and, 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 and I, let, let me give you an example. Answer is yes. Answer is yes, I hope, I hope. But um, 
But, but if you take a process where maybe the first step you want to do is um, you want to search and retrieve a bunch of data, and then you might want to plot that data. And then as a follow-up to that, you might want to uh, write the summary of it as, as well. That's a flow now where first you have to find it, then you have to go into a system to yep. plot the data, and then you have to write the description of it. I think those sorts of flows makes really make sense for them to be generated in real time as you're working on it. So users are doing this today. And tell us, how, how is, has the user response been to using SANA and experiencing this, for probably for the first time for some of them, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we, we also work in companies where, which is sort of beyond tech. And I think it's easy to think that this future is sort of universally distributed. Uh, but currently, it's a, it's a very small part of the population that's actually using this every day, automating their workflows. So what we talk about at Sana is how can we be the UI for AI for the next billion users? Um, and that's something we're really focused on, is how do you make these systems incredibly intuitive um, and delightful uh, to use? We like to speak about it as we're bringing the Scandinavian design ethos to, to AI, uh, the uh, ethos of, of simplicity and, and so on. And when you talk to those, those users, they're moving from you know, how many uh, paid uh, like, uh, vacation days do I have left this year to actually being able to do real work in the systems that's a massive difference. And that's this difference from 10% productivity gains to 90% productivity gains. And I think as you can show those capabilities and make that really intuitive for them, it's mind-blowing. It's really, you know, there was this notion uh, that Steve Jobs introduced of a bicycle for the mind. Um, and I think, you know, we're, 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 we're reaching a, a point where we have sort of airplanes for the mind where you can do things that you never before thought you, you were capable of, of doing. Um, and that's an incredibly empowering uh, system. Any specific anecdotes of what people have been able to do with SANA that you think is either mind-blowing or maybe unexpected, or maybe something that you, know, you didn't anticipate? So when uh, back, back during the, the, the pandemic, um, we, we thought knowledge access was actually a very critical uh, part um, for the pandemic because you had these new nurses that were getting into ICUs that had no clue of how you should install a mechanical ventilator um, and, and, yeah. and so on. And so we deployed our first RAG system back in, in 2020 actually to support in the pandemic. So we ended up having a 100,000 nurses using this every day to ask questions like you would ask questions to ChatGPT and get real-time responses um, that, that could help them. So I think that's one of these examples where knowledge access is so incredibly critical. Um, and you could actually see in the stats of the quality of the care that was delivered at the hospitals that had this implemented and the ones that, that didn't. So that's one of my favorite examples of you know, how empowering people with the best knowledge can actually help save lives. Yeah, that's very powerful. When people talk about you know, job loss and jo job changes that are going to occur, you know, a majority of, that, uh, of the places, it's really visible that actually we don't have enough even staff to fill this role. So yeah. we really need to get more productivity. Uh, and in, if anything, it's one place where digitization actually reduced productivity because cognitive labor is so, so intense for these professions. So I think it's extremely powerful that, that you're working on that and so, so incredibly uh, important. So as you build these apps, how does your design team think differently from before? What has changed? Talk, talk us a little bit through, you know, how, the, how would, should the audience be thinking about you know, changing their patterns and their workflows from you know, the design pre-2022 and design after 2022? Um, it's, a, it's, a very good, it's a very good question. I think UI had pretty much reached a, a point where there was very diminishing returns and changing anything in the UI. So everything sort of looked, looked the same. And, and I remember when I got into coding, this was the era where um, iOS apps were just introduced. 
And that was sort of the opportunity. First, just looked like web clients on a mobile, but but then eventually you could start start to reimagine these experiences. And you had, you know, Snapchat and Instagram and other apps taking advantage of of, of this. And I think we're at that that stage of of AI where you can really rethink the user experience in a very useful uh, in a very useful uh, way. How we think about that more process-wise is every six months we gather all of the teams um, and. Everyone gets to submit what they think is the most important problem in our field. And it comes from this Hamming question. Hamming was well known because a lot of the folks he had lunch with ended up winning Nobel Prizes. <laughs> so he started asking themselves, you know, why is everyone winning Nobel Prizes? And it's because he would always ask them this question. So we start with the Hamming question. From the Hamming questions, we derive some of the sort of key bets we want to make. And then we make a trailer. And the trailer is a completely unconstrained version of what we could build in six months. Um, so that's like the vision for, for the company, just like you would make a movie trailer uh, before you start making the entire uh, movie. And if people don't like the trailer, then you should probably not produce, produce the movie. Uh, so that's the sort of process we, we get through. And I think an important component of this is that it should be unconstrained. So we start with the unconstrained version, assuming the models are you know, an order of magnitude better, um, assuming uh, because that will, will be the case at some point, and then we start building backwards around the limitations of, of the models. But you probably don't want to start with the limitations of the models and then work too much upwards, because then your UI is just going to um, be redundant in, in a quite short time. Yeah, that's a brilliant advice. Actually, really important, because the the progress of the models is so, so quick, and changes are occurring literally daily. We're seeing hundreds of papers published. Uh, so you have to sort of skate to the where you think the puck is going, to the vision of what the world is going to look like, to the vision of where the models are going to be, whether you call it AGI or you call it super intelligence, or you call it just a much better model. Let's just uh, be very, very simple about that. If you don't go there, then you're basically building from for yesterday. So I think it's a, it's a fantastic advice and it, very, very well taken. So once you've, let's, let's say it's great, you've, uh, you've, you've created the vision, you decide which aspects of the vision are going, you're going to take for the product, right? You're going to infuse the product with. Maybe you even build some uh, exper experiment into the model, into, the, uh, into your user interface to test, right, how, it, how it's performing. What are you looking for in terms of the user signal? You know, in the last, you know, 10, 20 years, we were obsessed with product-led growth and measuring everything and ultimately optimizing for user attention. So the more the user is looking at the screen, the better the app is performing, the more it's monetizable. That was the mantra, you know, for the last 20 years. But it's changing now because productivity is, is, is improving because of this. And in fact, if the user is actually spending less time in front of the, the screen, that may be a better thing. So how are you guys thinking about this? What do you watch for? How do you know the user is happy without having to ask them every time? Um, it's, a, it's a very good question. I think it varies depending on the use case. So if you take a search use case, you want people to come back and search as much as possible, because that's something where if you've given them a good experience, they, they come back. Similarly, for an assistant use case, we're generating an answer for them. You want them to, to come back to the system a lot. Uh, but increasingly, to your point, these systems will be running in the background. We won't have to sit and prompt them all of the time, but you'll have agents, overseeing agents, overseeing agents, running these projects, and then coming to you with, with, with the insights. Not going ultimately. to Vegas. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Hopefully not going to Vegas. Um, and those sorts of systems act differently. You need to measure value differently. And, and often you want to map it to the customer you're working with and mm -hmm. what, what they're trying to, to solve. So if you're working in, 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 in sales, it's you know, how do you improve the productivity of your sales reps? Um, are you okay. able to fill in um, RFPs faster, improve win mm -hmm. rates and, and so on? Or if you're in customer support, can you uh, drive the resolution rates? So if you map that directly to the, the customer's KPI, that's, that's ideal uh -huh. because you know that you're, you're doing, doing a good, uh, good, good job. But otherwise, you want, you want to see DAUs in, this, in, in these systems. I think a very important part of doing that is being ubiquitous. Um, so if you're continuously relying on someone changing their muscle memory, that's going to be a painful ride. 
Um, but if you embed yourselves into their existing workflows and you make them way more, um, way more effective, um, then you can instantly get to, to, to DAUs. So I think trying to not change their behaviors too much, but plug into behaviors and, and augment them is, is important for, for driving that. And, and being goal-oriented towards their goal, which exactly. you can do with AI. That's, uh, that's a big, big change as well. So. Very, very important. So, you know, backstage we were talking about that we're in this period of Centaurus, right? We are humans collaborating with AI. And you brought in this uh, beautiful anal analogy or metaphor of uh, humans uh, working with machines to solve, uh, um, to compete in chess tournaments used to be better, you know, than just having a machine. Do you think that this period will end at some point, and basically the majority of the tasks are going to be machine handled. How do you see this transition, and where do you see the end? What's the big vision? Yeah, so I used to, I think I, I was back here speaking at Slush back in, in 2017, and I always used to give this example because people were, were scared of, of AI, and I said, you know what? Um, if the best chess programs beat the best uh, you know, chess players, but if you mix the best chess program with an average chess player, they can beat the best chess program. And people felt very happy about that situation. Unfortunately, I can't, I can't say that anymore because it's no, no, longer, no longer true. Which you might think, okay, this is really bad news for, for us because we're at this sort of centaur, uh, human augmented period now. It will last two years or so. We can make up for all of the gaps of the system, but then we'll all be irrelevant. But I don't think that's quite, quite true, actually. Um, so I had this example uh, last summer where uh, I had this idea that you could apply fluid dynamics to org charts. And you could apply the fluid dynamics algos to org charts to perfectly model what an org chart should look like. The issue was I don't know anything about fluid dynamics. But then I could just use my assistant. And my assistant and I were sitting and we were playing with this and we were applying the fluid dynamics algos to org charts and sort of figuring out the optimal uh, org charts from there. And, and that is to say, I think, you know, this will be the like, return of the renaissance. Like when each one of us has a, has a polymath that has all, of, all science, all of the world's knowledge, has all of your tools and, and is instantly accessible for you, you won't ha need domain and knowledge to explore um, new fields, but you can ultimately just use this uh, assistant to, to do so. And that is to say, I think we, we will all be Leonardo da Vinci's, and there was, will be a very exciting era, um, but, but most likely we won't be doing this task where we're currently sort of covering up for, this, uh, for these systems. So if you're a lawyer, maybe you should consider changing your, your career. Um, <laughs> what do you recommend? I need, I need advice on that. <laughs> um, but, um, but, but you would, you would probably end up um, sitting in situations where you're doing the negotiations, the, the human aspects uh, are around, the, around this. But I think it will be a very empowering period where humans will be able to explore science at a quicker rate. And this is not, you know, sort of at 20% in improvements, I think you'll be able to explore science 100 times more effectively, and that's really exciting. And learn faster, right? We already see this with kids, you know, they started by learning on YouTube, but YouTube is ultimately, my son used to tell me, is too slow, to, so, so they watch it on 2x, right? But if you want to go also in depth, you need more, and the, comp the compression engine of, an a of AI, of course, provides that. So you're basically saying we're going to go back to being able to be Renaissance people, right? Because that went away about 100 years ago. We just can't absorb all the knowledge into our heads. So exactly. we'll have a little bit of an offload and then we can, we can do it all, all over again. Is exactly. That right? Well, was that beautiful notion? I want to thank Joel for joining us here today. Thank you so much and for amazing work that you're doing building SANA. I can't wait and until all my work is automatically done and all I have to do is talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for, for having me, Lila. This was awesome. Thank you so much.